And I just want to warn you up front that, that I know I'm going to offend some people in this room. Let me assure you that's not the point. I'm not being deliberately provocative. I, I am simply worried. Uh, I think religion is the most divisive and dangerous ideology that we have ever produced. Uh, and what's more, it's the only ideology that is systematically protected from criticism, both from within and without. Is that the evidence for our religious doctrines is either terrible or non-existent. And this subsumes all claims about the existence of a personal God, the divine origin of certain books, the virgin birth of certain people, uh, the veracity of ancient miracles, all of it. All religious people are atheists with respect to everyone else's religion. I mean, we're all atheists with respect to the thousands of dead gods who lie in that mass grave we call mythology. I mean, think of Thor and Isis and Zeus. You know, they, they, these were once gods in good standing among our ancestors. Let's, let's begin with the specific claim that a, a given religion is true. There are two problems with arguing this. The first is that, as Bertrand Russell pointed out over a century ago, they can't all be true. I mean, given the sheer diversity of, of religions on offer, even if we knew that one of them was absolutely true, I mean, even if we knew this was, this was God's multiple choice exam, is it A, Judaism, B, Christianity, C, Islam, even if we knew we were in this situation, every believer should expect to wind up in hell purely as a matter of probability. Now, but there's no question that disciplines like meditation and prayer can have a profound effect upon the human mind. But do the positive experiences of, say, Christian mystics over the ages suggest that Jesus is the sole savior of humanity? Not even remotely, because, because Christians have been having these experiences, but so have Buddhists and Muslims and even atheists. That yogis and mystics uh, are said to be walking on water and raising the dead and flying without the aid of technology, uh, materializing objects, reading minds, foretelling the future, R right now. In fact, all of these powers have been ascribed to Satya Sai Baba, the, the South Indian guru, by an uncountable number of eyewitnesses. Now, he even claims to have been born of a virgin. In any case, so consider, as though for the first time, the foundational claim of Christianity. The claim is this, that miracle stories of a sort that today surround a person like Satya Sai Baba become especially compelling when you set them in the pre-scientific religious context of the first century Roman Empire decades after their supposed occurrence. We have Satya Sai Baba's miracle stories attested to by thousands upon thousands of living eyewitnesses, and they don't even merit an hour on the Discovery Channel. But you place a few miracle stories in some ancient books, and half the people on this earth think it a legitimate project to organize their lives around them. Does anyone else see a problem with that? Uh, th this would be amusing if it were not having such a disastrous effect upon our public policy. It, it, it is impeding medical research and the teaching of science in this country. 30% of te biology teachers in the United States at the high school level don't even mention evolution because of the, the, ha to, because of the hassle occasioned by the, just the, the religious hysteria that it provokes in their students and their students' parents. You all remember the, the recent presidential debate where three Republican candidates for the, the presidency solemnly raised their hands to testify that they don't believe in evolution. And there was no, there was no follow-up question. I mean, this is embarrassing. The, the contents of these books are deemed to be so profound that they could not possibly have been produced by the human mind. Please consider how implausible this is. Consider how differently we treat scientific texts and discoveries. In the year 1665, it was beginning in the summer of 1665, Isaac Newton went into isolation to dodge the outbreak of plague that was incidentally laying waste to the pious men and women of England. Uh, and when he, when he had 
emerged from his solitude. He had invented the integral and differential calculus. He had discovered the laws of universal gravitation and motion. He had set the field of optics on its foundation. Now, many scientists think this is the most awe-inspiring display of human intelligence in the history of human intelligence. And yet, no one is tempted to ascribe this to divine agency. We know that th these, these accomplishments were, were affected by a mortal, and a, and a very unpleasant mortal at that. <laughs> and yet, literally billions of us deem the contents of the Bible and the Quran so profound as to rule out the possibility of, of terrestrial authorship. Now, given the depth and breadth of human achievement, I think this is almost a miracle in its own right. It seems to me a miraculous misappropriation of awe. It, it took two centuries of continuous human ingenuity on the, part of, on, on the part of some of the smartest people who have ever lived to significantly improve upon Newton's achievement. How difficult would it be to improve the Bible? I mean, anyone in this tent could improve this, this supposedly inerrant text scientifically, historically, ethically, spiritually in a matter of moments. I mean, consider the possibility of improving the Ten Commandments. I mean, this may seem to be setting the bar kind of high because these are, this is the only part of the Bible, the only text that, the, that God felt the need to physically write himself and in stone. Consider the second commandment, thou shalt not erect any graven images. Is this really the second most important thing <laughs> upon which to admonish all future generations of human beings? I mean, is, this, is this as good as it gets ethically and spiritually? The basic fact is, on this point of morality, is that we decide what is good in our good books. I mean, we come to the Bible and we see that it says in Leviticus, if a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night, you're supposed to stone her to death on her father's doorstep. We choose to reject this pearl of ancient wisdom. And then we choose to emphasize something like the golden rule. So that the guarantor of our morality is in our brains, not in our books. The claim that we're the only species that has moral impulses is also false. I mean, we, we, uh, clearly, our ability, our ability to cooperate with one another can be explained in evolutionary terms. I mean, chimpanzees, with whom we share 99% of our DNA, find one another's emotional lives contagious, just as we do. They're motivated to reconcile after disputes, to comfort one another. Chimpanzees have even died trying to save other chimpanzees from drowning. They react negatively to situations that they perceive as unfair, like the unequal distribution of food. Given how gregarious all primates are, it is not a surprise that evolution would have selected for a variety of ethical concerns and, and social instincts. Now, of course, there are other reasons to doubt the usefulness of religion. And many of these are enunciated on a daily basis by bomb blasts. I mean, how, how useful is it that millions of Muslims believe in the metaphysics of martyrdom? How useful is it that, that the Sunni and the Shia in Iraq have such heartfelt religious differences? How useful is it that so many Jewish settlers think that the creator of the universe promised them a patch of desert on the Mediterranean? How useful has, has Christianity's anxiety about sex been these last 70 generations? Now, th those who conflate usefulness and truth in defense of religion generally argue that, that religion provides the most reliable foundation for morality. Now, again, before we even, we're even tempted to evaluate this claim, please notice that it is a non sequitur. It is not, even if, even if religion made people moral, this would not provide evidence for the existence of God or that Jesus is his son or any specific doctrinal proposition to which people are attached. Every religion could function like a placebo. They could, they could be extremely useful and entirely barren of content. But let's talk for a moment about the supposed link between morality and, and religion. It seems to me that 
religion gives people bad reasons to be good, where good reasons are actually available. I mean, ask yourself, which is more moral? Helping the poor, feeding the hungry, defending the weak, out of a mere concern for their well-being, or doing so because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it? The truth is, people do not need to be threatened with damnation to love their children, to love their friends, to want to collaborate with strangers, or indeed to recognize that helping strangers can be one of their greatest sources of happiness. And what kind of morality is it that is entirely predicated on a self-interested desire to escape damnation? This seems to bypass the very core of what we mean by morality, which is an actual concern for the welfare of other human beings. Clearly, it is possible to teach our children to form such a concern and to grow in empathy and compassion without lying to ourselves or to them about the nature of the universe, without pretending to know things we do not know. You can teach your children the golden rule as an utterly wise ethical precept without pretending to know that Jesus was born of a virgin. It's also worth observing that the most atheistic societies on the planet, like Sweden and Denmark and the Netherlands, are in many respects the most moral. They, they have rates of violent crime that, that are far lower than our own in the US. Uh, and they're more generous, both within their own population and in the developing world on a per capita basis. What about this notion that we get our morality out of scripture? Well, clearly we don't get our most basic moral impulses out of scripture because these can be seen emerging very early. I mean, toddlers 18 months old will, will spontaneously try to comfort somebody who looks upset. And a person clearly doesn't learn that cruelty is wrong by re reading the Bible or the Quran because if you don't already know that going in, you're just going to be confronted with, with endless celebrations of cruelty in these texts. I mean, these, these books are, are bursting with celebrations of cruelty, both human and divine. I mean, the, the God of the Bible hates sodomy and will kill you for it, but he rather enjoys the occasional human sacrifice. <laughs> I, mean, I think at the very least we can, we can say he doesn't quite have his priorities straight. In the Old Testament, we witness the most immoral behavior imaginable. Genocide, ethnic cleansing, sexual slavery, the murder of children, kidnapping, all of it not only permitted by God, but mandated by God. And if, 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 if these events occurred in our own time, half the prophets and kings of Israel would be shackled and brought to the Hague for crimes against humanity, including Moses for slaughtering the Midianites, including Joshua for slaughtering the Amalekites, including Elijah for slaughtering the, the prophets of Baal. I mean, these men, by, by our standards today, they were utter psychopaths. Rationalizing the barbarism we find in the Old Testament merely renders it irrelevant. It doesn't render these books morally wise. I mean, it is faint praise indeed if the best that can be said of much of Scripture is that it can now be safely ignored. I mean, the truth is, the Bible in its totality, Old Testament, New Testament, support slavery. If we recognize anything, if we, if, if we converge on any point in ethical terms now, it's that slavery is evil. Nowhere in the Bible is this evil recognized, much less repudiated. The slaveholders of the South were on the winning side of a theological argument. They knew it. They never stopped talking about it. The best God does in, in the Old Testament is to admonish us not to beat our slaves so badly that we injure their eyes or their teeth, or, or not to beat them so badly with a rod that they die on the spot. If they die after a day or two, no problem. I think it should go without saying that this is not the kind of moral insight that got rid of slavery in the United States. Or consider the treatment of women. I mean, for millennia, the great theologians and, and prophets of our religions have set to work on the, the riddle of womanhood. And the result in various times and places has been widow burning and honor killing and genital mutilation. 
a cultic obsession with virginity. Uh, but other, just other forms of, of physical and psychological abuse so kaleidoscopic in variety as to scarcely admit of being summarized. But the biblical God has made it perfectly clear that women are expected to live in, in absolute subjugation to their fathers until the moment they are pressed into connubial service to their husbands. And the New Testament offers no relief. I mean, St. Paul put it in his letter to the Ephesians, wives be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their husbands in all things. The, the Quran delivers the same message. And on most translations, argue, says that, that uh, disobedient wives should be whipped or scourged or beaten. Now recall the blissful lives of women in Afghanistan under the Taliban. Or think about the, the millions of women who even now are forced to wear the veil under Islam. Or who are, who, who are forced into these, these forced marriages with men they have never met. And you will realize that th these kinds of religious opinions have consequences. The net effect of religion, especially in, in the Abrahamic tradition, has been to demonize female sexuality and portray women as, as morally and intellectually inferior to men. In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 22, God says that if a woman doesn't scream loudly enough, while being raped, she should be stoned to death as an accessory to her own defilement. And there's no escaping the view in the, in the Bible and the Quran that women have been put on earth to serve men, to keep their homes in order, and to be incubators of sons. Finally, there's, there's this notion that atheism is responsible for the greatest crimes in the 20th century. Now this is actually, it's quite amazing to me. This is the most frequent objection I come across, so I think I should deal with it briefly. Um, it is amazing how many people think that the crimes of Hitler and Pol Pot and Mao were the result of atheism. The truth is, this is a total misconstrual of what went on in those societies and, and of the psychological and social forces that allow people to follow their dear leader over the brink. I mean, the problem with fascism and communism was not that they were too critical of religion. The problem is they're too much like religions. I mean, these are, these are utterly dogmatic systems of, of thought. I, mean, I recently had a, a debate with Rick Warren in the, in the pages of Newsweek, and he suggested that, that North Korea was a model atheist society and that any atheist with the courage of his convictions should want to move there. The truth is, North Korea is organized exactly like a faith-based cult centered on the worship of, uh, worship of Kim Jong-il. The North Koreans apparently believe that the shipments of food aid that they receive from us to keep them from starving to death are actually devotional offerings to Kim Jong-il. Is too little faith really the problem with North Korea? Is, is, is too much skeptical inquiry what is wrong here? Yes, Auschwitz, the Gulag, and the Killing Fields are not the product of atheism. They are pr they're the product of other dogmas run amok. Nationalism, political dogma. Hitler did not engineer a genocide in Europe because of atheism. In fact, Hitler doesn't even appear to have been an atheist. He, he regularly invoked Jesus in his speeches. But that's beside the point. He did it on the basis of other beliefs, dogmas about Jews and, and the, the purity of German blood. So I submit to you that there, there really is no society in human history that has ever suffered because its population became too reasonable, too reluctant to embrace dogma, or too demanding of evidence. Now, what about the charge that atheism is dogmatic? Let's get this straight. Jews, Christians, and Muslims claim that their holy books are so profound, so prescient of humanity's needs, that they could have only been written by an omniscient being. An atheist is simply a person who has entertained this claim, read the books, and found the claim to be ridiculous. This is not dogmatism. There's nothing that an atheist needs to believe on insufficient evidence in order to reject the biblical God. What dogma have we all embraced 
to not take Apollo and Zeus into account as we go about our day? What, would it be dogmatic to doubt that the Iliad or the Odyssey was dictated by the creator of the universe? The atheist is simply saying, as Carl Sagan did, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If ever there were an antidote to dogmatism, this is it. There, there's a related claim that atheists and scientists generally are arrogant. Now, I, this is rather ironic. The, the truth is, is that when scientists don't know something, like why the universe came into being or how the first self-replicating molecules formed on Earth, they tend to admit it. Pretending to know things you do not know is a profound liability in science. You get punished for this rather quickly. But pretending to know things you do not know is the lifeblood of faith-based religion. Any, uh, this is really one of the profound ironies of religious discourse in the, the frequency with, with which you can hear religious people praise themselves for their humility <laughs> while tacitly claiming to know things about cosmology and physics and chemistry and paleontology that no scientist knows. The, 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 the door leading out of religious literalism doesn't open from the inside. I mean, these, these religions have been moderated because of, because of the pressure of modernity. I mean, it's, it's secular politics and a, and a conception of human rights and our, our growing scientific understanding of the universe has applied pressure, much more so in the, in the case of Judaism and Christianity than it has in Islam, because Islam has been isolated from the Enlightenment and you know, even the Renaissance in some significant sense. Um, and so this, this comes from outside. So this is not to be credited to faith. This is, this is the legacy of faith continually losing the argument to science and secular politics and common sense. This, but it, so so you're, are you going to credit the Catholic Church that did not absolve Galileo of heresy until 1992? I mean, it's, it's, this, is, this, is a, this organization is very slow to move. And, and I, I think at some point, it would take something like their prescription against contraception use. I mean, this is, this is flagrantly immoral, getting people killed throughout the developing world. I mean, this is ministers go into villages riddled with AIDS and preach the sinfulness of condom use. Okay, shockingly immoral behavior mandated by their religious faith. I, I certainly hope to, to live to see the day where the Vatican recants this dogma and they say, you know, this was a mistake, condoms are, are blameless, that'll be a good thing. Who's going to get the credit? The Vatican, when that happens? Um, this is, this, this is a, a, a dinosaur of an organization that has really been slow to make the, mo the simplest accommod accommodations to basic human sanity. So that and I'm not the first person to notice that it's a, it's a very strange sort of loving God who would make salvation depend on believing in him on bad evidence. Okay, it's, it's, I mean, if you lived 2,000 years ago, there was evidence galore. I mean, he was just performing miracles, but apparently he got tired of being so helpful. Okay, and so now we, we all inherit this very heavy burden of the doctrine's implausibility and, 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 and the effort to square it with what we now know about the cosmos and, we, and what we know about the all too human origins of scripture becomes more and more difficult. All right. Nine million children die every year before they reach the age of five. Okay, picture picture a, a, an Asian tsunami of the sort we saw in 2004 that killed a quarter of a million people. One of those every 10 days, killing children only under five. Okay, it's 20, 24,000 children a day, 1,000 an hour, 17 or so a minute. That means before I can get to the end of this sentence, some few children, very likely, will have died in terror and agony. Okay, think, think of the parents of these children. Think of the fact that, that most of these men and women believe in God, and are praying at this moment for their children to be spared, and their prayers will not be answered. Okay, but according to Dr. Craig, this is all part of God's plan. Any God who would allow children by the millions to suffer and die in this way, 
and their parents to grieve in this way either can do nothing to help them or doesn't care to. He is therefore either impotent or evil. And worse than that, on Dr. Craig's view, most of these people, many of these people certainly, will be going to hell because they're praying to the wrong God. Just think about that. Okay, through no fault of their own, they were born into the wrong culture where they got the wrong theology and they missed the revelation. Okay, there, there are 1.2 billion people in India at this moment. Most of them are Hindus. Most of them, therefore, polytheists. Okay, in Dr. Craig's universe, no matter how good these people are, they are doomed. If you are, if you are praying to the monkey god Hanuman, you are doomed. You will be tortured in hell for eternity. Now, is there the slightest evidence for this? No. no. It just says so in Mark 9 and Matthew 13 and Revelation 14. Okay, perhaps you'll remember from the Lord of the Rings, it says when the elves die, they go to Valinor, but they can be reborn in Middle Earth. Okay, I say that just as a point of comparison. Okay, so God created the cultural isolation of the Hindus, Okay. He engineered the circumstance of their deaths in ignorance of revelation. And then he created the penalty for this ignorance, which is an eternity of conscious torment in fire. Okay. On the other hand, on Dr. Craig's account, your run-of-the-mill serial killer in America, okay, who, who spent his life raping and torturing children, need only come to God, come to Jesus on death row, and after a final meal of fried chicken, he's going to spend an eternity in heaven after death. Okay. One thing should be crystal clear to you. This vision of life has absolutely nothing to do with moral accountability. Okay. And please notice the double standard that people like Dr. Craig use to, to exonerate God from all this evil. Okay. We're told that God is loving and kind and just and intrinsically good. But when someone like myself points out the ob rather obvious and compelling evidence that God is cruel and unjust because he visits suffering on innocent people of a scope and scale that would, would embarrass the most ambitious psychopath, okay, we're told that God is mysterious. Okay, who can understand God's will? Okay, and yet this is precisely this merely human understanding of God's will is precisely what believers use to establish his goodness in the first place. You know, something good happens to a Christian. Some, he feels some bliss while praying, say, or he sees some positive change in his life, and we're told that God is good. Okay, but when children by the tens of thousands are torn from their parents' arms and drowned, we're told that God is mysterious. This is how you play tennis without the net. This kind of faith is, is really is the perfection of narcissism. I mean, God loves me, don't you know? He, he cured me of my eczema. He, he makes me feel so good while singing in church. And, and just when we had given up hope, he found a banker who was willing to reduce my mother's mortgage. Okay. Given all, the, all that this God of yours does not accomplish in the lives of others. Given, given the, the misery that's being imposed on some helpless child at this instant, this kind of faith is obscene. Okay, this, to think in this way is to fail to reason honestly or to care sufficiently about the suffering of other human beings. But this, to me, is the, is the true horror of religion. Okay, it allows perfectly decent and sane people to believe by the billions what only lunatics could believe on their own. Good. Okay. And many see no alternative but to insert the God of Abraham, an Iron Age God of war, into the clockwork as an invisible arbiter of moral truth. Okay. It is wrong to cheat on your spouse because Yahweh deems that it is so. Okay. Which is curious because in other moods, Yahweh is perfectly fond of genocide and slavery and human sacrifice. So here's the only assumption you have to make. Imagine a universe in which every conscious creature suffers as much as it possibly can, 
as much as it possibly can for as long as it can. Okay, I call this the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, the worst possible misery for everyone is bad. Okay, if, if, if the word bad applies anywhere, it applies here. Now, if you think the worst possible misery for everyone isn't bad, or maybe it has a silver lining, or maybe there's something worse, I don't know what you're talking about. And what's more, I'm pretty sure you don't know what you're talking about either. Now, the Taliban are still my favorite example of a culture that is struggling mightily to build a society that's clearly less good than many other societies on offer. The average lifespan for women in Afghanistan is 44 years. They have a 12% literacy rate. They have the highest, almost the highest infant mortality and maternal mortality in the world, and almost the highest f fertility. So this is one of the best places on earth to watch women and infants die. Okay, it seems to me perfectly obvious that the, the best response to this dire situation, which is to say the most moral response, is not to throw battery acid in the faces of little girls for the crime of learning to read. Now, some of you might worry that I haven't defined well-being enough. How can, how can something this loose as a concept be the, the, the benchmark of, of uh, objective values? Well, consider by analogy the concept of physical health. Physical health is very difficult to define. You know, it, it used to be that if you were healthy, you could expect to live to the ripe old age of 40. You know, now our lifespan, our life expectancy has doubled in the last 150 years. What, what does health mean? Okay, well, it has something to do with not always vomiting, okay, not being in excruciating pain, not running a fever. Okay, but how, how fast should a healthy person be able to run? Okay, that question might not have an answer. Okay, but this does not make the, the, the question of health vacuous. Okay, it doesn't make it merely a matter of opinion or of cultural construction. Okay, the distinction between a healthy person and a dead one is about as clear and consequential as any we ever make in science. Okay, and notice that no one is ever tempted to attack the philosophical underpinnings of medicine with questions like, well, who are you to say that not always vomiting is healthy? What if you meet someone who wants to vomit and he wants to vomit until he dies? Okay. <laughs> How could you argue that he is not as healthy as you are? Okay. Is the worst possible misery for everyone really bad? Once again, I, we have hit philosophical bedrock with the shovel of a stupid question. Because, because the God that our neighbors believe in is essentially an invisible person. He's a creator deity who created the universe to have a relationship with one species of primate. Lucky us. <laughs> and and he, he's, got, he's got galaxy upon galaxy to attend to, but he's especially concerned with what we do, and, and he's especially concerned with what we do while naked. <laughs> and he, he almost certainly disapproves of homosexuality. And he's created this, this cosmos as a vast laboratory in which to test our powers of credulity. And the test is this. Can you believe in this God on bad evidence, which is to say on faith? And, and if you can, you will win an eternity of happiness after you die. And it's precisely this sort of God and this sort of scheme that you must believe in if you're going to have a, a, any kind of future in politics in this country, a, no matter what's your gifts. I mean, you could be, you could be an, an unprecedented genius. You could look like George Clooney. You could have a billion dollars, and you could have the social skills of Oprah, and you are going nowhere in politics in this country unless you believe in that sort of God. That scheme, I, I, agree, I agree with you about that scheme. There are many people having these remarkable experiences in every traditional context. That in and of itself, proves that all of these religions are wrong. Oh, all, all, of, these, all of these religions <laughs> claim very funny. their exclusive validity. And the fact that you have Christians having deep experiences of peace, and you have Muslims, and you have atheists, and you have Buddhists, it proves that there's a deeper principle that should be talked about 
in a non-sectarian way that is not held hostage by Iron Age, age literature does. The, the great irony of, of the popular conception of sci science as arrogant is that when you go to a scientific meeting, you, you, don't, you don't see arrogance. I mean, you're, you're about as likely to see real arrogance as you're likely to see nudity at a scientific conference. I mean, this is, this is people are constantly uh, offering caveats and hedges toward what they say. They, 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 every, every statement is couched in, I'm sure there's someone in the room who knows more about this than me, but because everyone is desperate to avoid public embarrassment. Now, this seems to be something you're not uh, doing. <laughs> if, imagine if you drawing cartoons of Hercules could get you killed. The dialogue between science and religion has gone this way. It has been one of relentless and one-directional erosion of religious authority. I, I would challenge anyone here to think of a question upon which we once had a scientific answer, however inadequate, but for which now the best answer is a religious one. Now you can think of an uncountable number of questions that run the other way, where, where we once had a religious answer, uh, and now the authority of religion has been battered and nullified uh, by science and by moral progress and secular progress generally. This is, we, we come from tradition, from generations of people who did, who did not know a damn thing about the causes of events in the world that really concern them, the spread of disease, the, the failure of crops, the weather. Um, and so religious discourse has changed. We're not sacrificing people uh, happily now, but it has changed by virtue of progress from the outside. I mean, cer just certain modes of operation are no longer tenable. When you can get a weather report on the evening news, you no longer have to sacrifice a child in a vain attempt to control the weather. Um, science is the one language game we are playing where we get really straight and rigorous about what constitutes evidence, where there's a process of peer review, uh, where you have a lot of smart people trying to prove you wrong, and where you actually win points by proving yourself wrong. And this is not what religions are up to. Religions are not uh, falsifiable in this way. One, pro one problem with a discussion like this is we have a word religion right. that is a suitcase term. I mean, religion is a, is a word like sport. You know, you have, a, you have a sport like, you know, tie boxing where people get killed and hit in the head with elbows and knees. And then you have a sport like lawn bowling, you know. And it, what is in common between these sports apart from breathing? <laughs> Not much. And so, and yet they're both sports. And religion is like that. You have a religion uh, like Jainism, which I occasionally reference because it is the, is the one truly nonviolent religion. I mean, the, the, the core dogma of Jainism is nonviolence. So, so that no matter how fanatical you get as a Jain, you are never going to be, be a Jain suicide bomber. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> You simply cannot make sense of it by the lights of Jainism. Now, by no stretch of the imagination is Islam a religion of nonviolence. Islam is a religion of violence in certain circumstances, and it is a great danger to us all that these circumstances can be constru can construed with enough agility as to apply almost anywhere, anytime, to anyone who wants to die for, for the faith. Now, I'm not saying all Muslims view their religion this way, but there are, there are very few tools within Islam by which to say, oh, Osama bin Laden has completely misconstrued the faith. He has not completely misconstrued the faith. So, but, so, so between Islam and Jainism, you know, we have a, a range of convictions and behaviors born of them. Uh, and the kind of, the style of, of discourse that you're using to talk about again, what religion should be, not what it is, I would argue, uh, just, just obfuscates this terrain. We have people really killing and dying based on propositions that they are granting credence to, and, the, and, and these beliefs are thriving in, in, an, in a context in which they are immune to criticism. And we, and we are collaborating in that process by not criticizing them publicly, incessantly, relentlessly until we break this spell. I see. And now another question over here. Is that uh, the other thing that, that Mother Teresa's letters uh, articulate is the process she went through uh, of confessing her doubts to her superiors and, 
at one point it was recommended that she view all of this as a sign that she was sharing Jesus' suffering on the cross. Um, now, this is kind of a brilliant moment of hermetically sealing a, uh, uh, a worldview. Um, and so when I wrote about this, I said, ask yourself, when even the doubts of experts are used to confirm a doctrine, how could it possibly be disproved? And this is, this is, you see this all the time yeah. in religion. You do. And this is precisely what you don't see in science. I mean, people have this, this naive idea. When, when you think of yourself as a soul that may yet survive your death, you are thinking of yourself very much intact. I mean, the, the stories of going into the tunnel of light and recognizing grandma uh, entail a fair amount of mentality, mentality we know can be disrupted at the level of the brain, uh, because we, we see these neurological complaints all the time. Uh, and the, the proposition is that if you damage a brain a little bit, you destroy English the, and uh, an ability to recognize faces. But if you damage it totally at death, lo and behold, the soul, still able to recognize grandma, will rise off the brain uh, and, and go into a tunnel of light. These are, these are scientific claims, and they are profoundly naive. Right. What they assume is that there is something inside of you that is eternal, which yeah. I assume as well. And it doesn't seem, to me anti, doesn't seem to me anti-scientific. Well, it's anti-scientific if you um, believe that you have good evidence for that. I mean, this, this, is, this is what's anti-scientific. When your certainty, when your convictions don't scale with your evidence. I mean, I'm actually open-minded on the survival of death. I, I right. don't you know say about reincarnation, that there could even be evidence for it in your book. Yes, I mean, I, I can easily tell you what would constitute evidence. I'm not saying this evidence exists, but um, I, mean, I can tell you what would constitute evidence for the truth of Mormonism. It's, it's, it's just not forthcoming. Uh, ask yourself, when you pick up the Bible or the Hebrew Bible um, or any holy book uh, and find ethical wisdom in there, well, how, what is that process like? I mean, you pick up... Uh, Leviticus or Deuteronomy and you find that if a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night you're supposed to stone her to death on her father's doorstep okay presumably you choose to reject that pearl of ancient wisdom uh, and then you find another line you know I think this is also in Leviticus love your neighbor as yourself um, uh, or the golden rule as preached in the New Testament uh, and this resonates with you as a as a, as a good um, operating premise to generate m further moral intuitions. Uh, if nothing else, it's a good ideal to live toward. Uh, now, that process, you, the guarantor of your morality in that case is not the book. It's in your brain. Uh, and th this kind of truth testing is something that we bring to religion. Now, religion does a lot of work on people, and you can get good people to believe some very terrible things. Uh, in the name of God, and this is what worries me about religion. And implicit. The idea is that at the time, I mean, the Canaanites were so ill-behaved that just getting together a coherent list of reasons to kill your neighbor was an improvement over the general barbarity of the time. <laughs> this, this is often claimed, the idea that the Bible is just the best that was possible for that community in that period in history. You know, the 5th century B.C. was an age of such barbarism that Leviticus is really kind of a, it's like the, you know, the U.S. Constitution, a brilliant document. Uh, it is not a brilliant document. It is, it is an appalling guide to morality. Uh, and, the, and just think of how good a book, just think of how good a book would be if it were authored by the creator of the universe. I mean, there's not a single sentence in any book of the Bible that could not have been written by somebody living in the Iron Age. This is a problem for claiming that this is the best book we have. Uh, and, and so the, the, the problem is, if you're going to live, if you're living by Leviticus and Deuteronomy, uh, you should be a good Jew for all time. Now, why are you not a good Jew for stoning, stoning your neighbor for working on the Sabbath today? You are not because we have different standards of morality and, and reasonableness. Uh, and and we, we, happily we do. And those came from outside of religion. Okay. Even if I conceded that religion is, is profoundly useful, so useful as to be indispensable. You know, people without religion will just rape and kill each other, and we, we don't want that, so 
by all means, fill the churches and mosques and synagogues. Uh, that would not, for a moment, grant credence to the idea that one of our books was dictated by an omniscient being or that such a being exists. And, uh, to, I, you know, I think we should, we waste time talking about Stalin and Hitler and, and Pol Pot, frankly, because these were, these were political religions. These were dogmatisms through and through, and when anyone started to make too much sense in opposition to these dogmatisms, they were carted off and killed. Uh, these were not these, these were not contexts in which rational discourse prevailed and the best idea won. Uh, so to call them science is just to misuse the term, uh, and and it's I mean in the case of Hitler it's just a, a total non sequitur because Hitler never really repudiated Jesus and he used Jesus in his speech and he's you know he was facilitated by a thousand years of religious fulminating against the Jews in the name of Christianity. I mean this is uh, religion is implicated, certainly, in the Holocaust. And so this, this notion that uh, Stalin and Hitler and Pol Pot uh, were doing what they did because of atheism, because of non-belief in God. I mean, ask yourself, is, is too much skeptical inquiry really what's wrong with North Korea? I mean, the North Koreans are a cargo cult armed with nuclear weapons right now. They think that the food aid that we give them is a, is a devotional offering to the genius of their dear leader. They are systematically impoverished, both physically and in terms of information. They are, they, 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 too much knowledge, any knowledge is too much knowledge uh, in North Korea. This is not a, a, a paradise of reasonableness. The, the, the history of the Jews in Europe is a history punctuated but rather ceaselessly by no questions and murder that was explicitly religious. I mean, you have something like host desecration. Yes. I don't know if you know about this phenomenon that um, I came across while researching my first book. The, the communion host is thought to be once blessed, is thought to actually physically be the body of Jesus. And therefore, uh, if it's mistreated, this is, you know, you, you can literally, in torturing a cracker, you are torturing the body of Jesus. Uh, there are accounts of whole villages purged of Jews who were accused of having mistreated uh, crackers. Uh, you know, it, it, so, so, so the question is, does the belief in the transubstantiation, which is a belief that I would have thought uh, could be rather harmless, have anything to do with the idea that someone can mistreat a cracker uh, and that you should kill him for it? Yes, it does have something to do. It's impossible to believe in the torture of crackers unless mm -hmm. you think... But what, it's, but what it's not impossible. I think the best way to address the, the compatibility of science and, and religion is in the person of Francis Collins. I don't know if you know him. He ran the Human Genome Project for the U.S. He's a, um, a medical geneticist, uh, obviously a scientist with a great career in science, and he's also an evangelical Christian. Uh, and he's written a book entitled The Language of God where he claims to square his evangelical Christianity with the last 50 years of molecular biology and argue successfully that, that God exists. We know this based on scientific principles and um, Jesus is his son. Uh, now, I can't say that he's not a scientist, but what I can say is that the, the place in his book where he tells you when his doubts were re truly removed, the, the, his conversion experience, um, is uh, testifies to the to the the way the human mind can be partitioned, where where a scientist can 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 lapse in the most egregious way in in terms of his scientific standards. And the, because the passage goes like this: I was hiking in the Cascade Mountains and came upon a beautiful frozen waterfall. Uh, and my doubts were removed, and I fell to my knees in the dewy grass and surrendered myself to Christ. Uh, it's virtually verbatim. Uh, so now I would suggest to you that it should be obvious to all of you, and it certainly should have been obvious to Francis Collins, that if a frozen waterfall can testify to the divinity of Jesus, anything can mean anything. Um, he said he, he actually elaborated on this point in an interview for Time magazine. He said the waterfall was frozen in, in three streams, and this put him in the mind of the Trinity. Uh, okay, this is, this is psychotic thinking in any other context. You know 
Well, it's interesting. Whenever I find myself in this position criticizing religion, if I say that, for instance, uh, Muslims are uh, not justified in their belief in martyrdom, for instance, or Christians are not justified to believe that the uh, that Jesus was born of a virgin, resurrected, will be coming back to earth to wield his magic powers. Uh, I'm often met by Christians and Muslims of a more moderate persuasion who will say that I have completely caricatured the faith, that I have taken extremists to be representative mm. of the faith. Um, and there are a few problems with this response. I, I take your response, Ray, as a, as a version of that, that you know, not all Christians believe that X, Y, and Z. Um, first, it discounts the fact that, that so many millions and millions of Christians and Muslims do believe these things. I mean, we are living in a country where 53% of the, the population claims to believe that the, the universe is 6,000 years old and that we have no precursors in the natural world uh, apart from Adam and Eve, I mean, that we did not evolve out of prior life forms. This is a majority of the American population. Uh, so it seems to me this is, you can call this extremism. I mean, this is, these views are extreme in almost every respect. They are extremely silly. <laughs> they, are, they are extremely worthy of our denigration, but they are not a, extreme in the sense of being rare. Um, I, I, I have never for a moment believed, and I have never argued, that all bad things, all conflict, comes out of religion. Uh, I don't even know if most does. I, I think probably most uh, wars have been fought for reasons other than, than uh, religious ideology. But the, the larger issue is dogmatism. The larger issue is belief without sufficient evidence, belief that is uh, intrinsically divisive because it is immune to criticism, it is immune to the normal uh, tests of conversation, tests of reasonableness, and these beliefs that divide us into these separate moral communities where we have Christians against Muslims against Jews or blacks against whites or one nation against another nation based on nationalism. I think nationalism can be incredibly corrosive of everything we want to encourage in civilization. Uh, dogmatism and ideology immune to criticism is a problem. The problem, however, is that only in religion do we put a veneer of sanctity over dogmatism and call it faith, call it, and once called faith, it becomes a, a apparently necessary and redeeming and precious part of the human experience. I don't think it is, and I think we can have our ethics and have our spiritual experience, uh, indeed even become mystics, without ever presupposing anything on insufficient evidence and without ever lying to ourselves and other human beings about what we know to be true. You didn't seem to find anything to like about religion or anything even faintly redeeming about uh, the religious project. A am I overstating? Well, yeah, I think it's a matter of emphasis. I mean, I have certainly have not emphasized what I like about the Bible uh, in my writing, <laughs> though I mean, it's not without its uh, joys. I mean, there's some very good writing in there, and there's some, some rather... Uh, terrifying barbarism in there that is advocated not as allegory, but as, as prescriptions for how to live. Uh, and I think that's undeniable. Uh, many of these prescriptions have, have lost their shelf life. I mean, it's, the Bible, on balance, tells us to keep slaves. It tells us how to keep slaves. Now, this is a, an embarrassment, uh, I think a rather fatal embarrassment, to anyone who would then say the Bible is, a, is the best book of moral wisdom humanity has ever had. Uh, it's not the best book because it gets the question of slavery wrong uh, and slavery is perhaps the easiest and one of the most consequential moral problems we've ever had to face as a civilization. Uh, first of all, it must be conceded that there are no books in Scripture more heinous than the, the, the books in the Hebrew Bible like Deuteronomy and Exodus and Second Samuel. I mean, these, these are the books where it is just spelled out ad nauseum when you should kill people for, for theological offenses. Um, and if you f follow those prescriptions, you would have very much a, a world like we witnessed under the Taliban in Afghanistan with people having their heads cut off at, at halftime in a soccer match for, for adultery. Uh, but so even fundamentalist Christians and Orthodox Jews can't read their scripture altogether literally now. 
that's because of, of hundreds of years of colliding with modernity and secular progress and, and scientific progress. And we're not burning witches on street corners uh, anymore, and that's a good thing. But we did it for five long centuries. And as Reza knows, in most of the Muslim world, uh, you have taken your life in your hands if you uh, declare yourself an apostate. I mean, even in Afghanistan, where we invaded and gave them a constitution, apostasy is still punishable by death. And we still have to smuggle out that one guy who, who became a Christian on CNN and, and you know, had to be spirited away to Italy with a, with a diagnosis of mental illness to save his life in that country. For instance, in the end of faith, I cite these Pew polls that were done in nine Muslim countries, actually not the most radicalized. I and mean, the most radicalized countries wouldn't let the polling be done. But even in, even in Turkey, uh, the, you know, the Muslim success story on many fronts, the level of support for suicide bombing against non-combatants in defense of the faith was shocking. I mean, you, get, you just run the numbers. When 77% when of people in Lebanon say that it is justified, that's, you know, it's not a minority. It's not even close to a minority. In, even if it were only 5% of the Muslim world, that was radicalized by my lights. That is still a problem we have to talk about soberly. I mean, this is that we're still we're talking about 75 million people. If the poorest, most molested people were, by and large, the jihadists and the engineers and the architects and the doctors, the people who had a benefit of of uh, the good life, were disproportionately moderate then this analysis of yours would make some sense. But we have someone like uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri, right? A surgeon. He comes from one of the most respected families in Egypt. He's got doctors and judges and pharmacists, as far as the eye can see. Um, he is not an exception. He is not, if you correct for literacy in the Muslim world, support for suicide bombing goes up. I mean, this is the, the most radicalized people uh, are not the people who, in particular, well, you can see this in microcosm when you actually look at the biographies of the 19 hijackers. These were all college educated. Many of them had PhDs. I mean, it's just not the religion really is separable uh, as the most important va variable. And what is actually right on the surface to be seen is that these people are telling us what is motivating them. The jihadis are talking all day long about the pleasures that await martyrs in paradise, the, 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 just the, the horrors of living in proximity with the infidels, the, the desecration of the Muslim holy sites by the proximity of, of uh, uh, infidel troops on the ground. I mean, this is, you know, Osama bin Laden tells us what motivates him. He's telling us why he's not living in Paris and dating models with his inheritance. I mean, he's, he, he is being quite articulate, ad nauseum. Um, and so to deny the role that religion is playing, I would never for a moment say that, that there are not poor, mistreated people driven to extremis uh, and to extreme violence for reasons other than religion. Of course that happens. But this is a, a, this is a separable component. And, and you must have intended it to be a shocker. Most Muslims are utterly, utterly deranged by their religious faith. I've even heard you back off a little bit now uh, you went from most to some significant subset. Well, uh, no, but, I, okay, but, uh, let, me, but, let me just make it clear. I'm not yeah. backing off of that because uh, utterly deranged by the... I, mean, I, I set the bar rather low for utter derangement. <laughs> um, I mean, my, by my, lay, my, my, my lights, thinking that the Quran is the best book ever written on any subject, really, is getting you pretty close to derangement. Thinking that, it is, it, that someone should be killed for criticizing it or that, that, that it's a real problem that cartoonists caricature the, the Prophet Muhammad and they, you know, they should be um, uh, kidnapped, uh, that, that this is the kind of, these, the tre treading upon the sanctities of the religion is a, is a real social problem uh, that demands more energy uh, in its criticism than uh, suicide bombing. So I, I don't think we want someone making these decisions about when to go to war and when not to go to war who thinks that when he closes his eyes and just kind of tries to get a feeling for what to do, his intuitions just may be vetted by the creator of the universe. Uh, 
And I, and I take these people at their word. I mean, people believe this stuff. Uh, Christianity and Judaism have suffered a, a harrowing collision with modernity over the last 200 years. I mean, they have just had their religions mastered by science and secular politics and common sense to a degree that has not occurred in the Muslim world. I mean, the Muslim world has not had a reformation and it has not, it not, it has not had a renaissance. Uh, the Muslim world is, is amazingly isolated from the currents of, of criticism that have beaten back the, the fascistic and, and insane uh, practice of religion that, that endured for centuries in, uh, under Christendom. I mean, we were burning witches alive uh, and, and heretics for 500 years in Europe. We're not doing that anymore courtesy of scientific understanding of, of medicine, for one thing. I mean, we don't believe now that people are, are, are dying because their neighbor cast a spell on them. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, it, 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 that, was a hard, that was hard fought, that battle. It seems to me that you don't think that beliefs really have consequences. I mean, to, to, to attribute this to institutions as opposed to what people think uh, seems to me to completely miss uh, the way people uh, behave in this world, uh, why they behave the way they do, why they have the emotional reactions they have, uh, why they perpetrate violence when they do and why they don't. And all I'm arguing for is that beliefs have consequences and beliefs, religious beliefs, should be subjected to the same kinds of conversational pressures that we su subject all other beliefs to. And that this taboo that gives beliefs in the name of God a free ride in our discourse has to be lifted. And so I mean, you mentioned the, the, the second commandment at one point, the, the commandment against graven images. Um, you know, that, that commandment was responsible for the, the Muslim cartoon controversy. I mean, where did Muslims get it into their heads that you could not draw a picture of, the, of Muhammad? Uh, it is their uh, uh, endorsement of the second commandment. I, I can assure you that if the Quran said, by all means, caricature the prophet to the best of your ability, uh, for this pleases the Lord, uh, there would be no cartoon controversy. You would not have had people by the hundreds of thousands burning embassies and taking hostages. And I think something like 140 people died. And, uh, you know, it, that, was, that was just an, er, an eruption of egregious medieval stupidity. And it, was, it, was, it took the form it took because the religion is in the form it's in. People believe that specific tenet about... Uh, uh, idolatry. Well, that's plain. I mean, I am not imagining the link between Islam and violence, to take Islam in, as one example, because the people who are perpetrating this violence are telling us ad nauseum why they are doing this. I mean, this, is, this kind of analysis is it's like going into a church on Sundays and seeing people lined up for, to receive the Eucharist and asking them why they're doing this, and they tell you about the transubstantiation and their, their love for Jesus. And to discount all of that, we can't trust what they're saying. Actually, this is just, this is, this is just cracker-eating behavior. And, and it, it, as witnessed by the fact that it happens in other contexts. I mean, people eat crackers in other contexts, and there's a, a general love of crackers. Um, and so you can't, you, can't, you can't say that people are being motivated by their religion. It's, I, I need to deal with this charge of racism. It should be pretty easy to see that my criticism of Islam is not racist. Uh, first of all, it applies with equal felicity to white Muslims uh, as to any other ethnicity. Um, uh, it, it, in some sense, it even applies more to somebody like John Walker Lind, you know, a middle-class guy from, from Marin County who discovers the Quran and decides to go off and fight with the Taliban. Uh, it, it applies more, perhaps, to somebody like uh, uh, Adam Gadan, who comes from Orange County and goes off to be the, the PR guy for uh, Al-Qaeda, because these guys don't have the alibi of having been brainwashed since infancy by their indigenous Muslim parents. Uh, they, they've adopted this. So there's nothing racist about my criticism of Islam. I am criticizing the logical consequences of certain ideas, and I'm certainly not limiting my criticism of religion 
to Islam. I just happen to, to uh, one of the taboos I'm breaking quite consciously in my, in my speaking and writing is I'm noticing there's, that our religions are actually different. I mean, they, they don't all teach the same thing. And where they do teach the same thing, they don't teach it equally well. I mean, we are not going to have a problem with Jane suicide bombers, no matter how mistreated Jane's become in this world. The, the core principle of Jainism really is nonviolence. I mean, no matter how crazy you get as a Jain in terms of your religion, you're going to become less and less violent. I mean, that you, there's no way you can, you can justify any sort of violence by recourse to the, to the, the principles of Jainism. Uh, to argue that the core principle of Islam is nonviolence uh, is, is truly impossible. I mean, the, if anything, the core principle of, of Islam is jihad. Uh, it is, it is uh, convert, subjugate, or kill the infidel. I mean, the, the, the Quran and the Hadith do nothing so eloquently as demonize the infidel and talk about the imperative of, of uh, s spreading the faith. Uh, if you look at the example, the historical example of Muhammad, he's rather a different character than Jesus. He is not a hippie who got crucified. He, is, he was a conquering general, uh, and Muslims draw a lot from that example. Concer that whenever I criticize Islam, the f one of the first things I say is that nobody is suffering under Islam more than Muslims. I mean, no, and, and certainly nobody is suffering more than Muslim women. Uh, and so to, to obfuscate... To, to, call it, to call it racist to criticize this, this faith, which, which has, has I mean, the, the, the record of, of religion in general in terms of uh, the treatment of women is, is horrifying. I mean, you, the, the great geniuses of, of the Abrahamic tradition thought about the riddle of womanhood, and they gave us this, this cult of virginity, the forced marriages, bride burning, honor killing. I mean, it, 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 it is the, the, the fact that somebody like Ayan Hirsi Ali, a Somali woman who, who uh, became a Dutch parliamentarian and now is arguably one of the most hunted people on this planet because of her criticism of Islam. The idea that she has to deal with, with a multiculturalist criticism of her insensitivity to Islam, and this is a woman who has been, you know, uh, circumcised is a euphemism for it, uh, hunted, had her collaborator butchered in the street uh, in, in Amsterdam, and now uh, she is, is, a, is a recipient of the same kind of criticism. Uh, it, it is obscurantism. Our religions are different. 38% uh, of British Muslims now claim that, that to claim to believe that anyone who leaves the faith, anyone who commits the crime of apostasy, should be put to death. This is 38% of British Muslims. We're not talking about Pakistan or Afghanistan. Um, that's quite an alarming finding. Now, what percentage of them would actually be willing to kill someone who, who uh, leaves the faith? I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a distance between what you think and what you're actually going to do. But the idea that somehow... Uh, it is a tiny minority of people who profess these things, who actually believe them. There's no evidence for that. I mean, there, there is an apparently an inexhaustible supply of suicide bombers. Uh, people like Chris seem to, seem to imagine that the cause of this is not their belief in martyrdom. It's not the, not the idea that, uh, that you're going to get everything you want after you die, and, and there's nothing better than death in, in defense of Islam, which is what I argue. Uh, they seem to believe that it is poverty and economic desperation and lack of education. The reason why we know that can't be true is it, everything we find out about the kinds of people who hijack planes and fly them into buildings or blow themselves up on, on the tubes in uh, the UK, they are disproportionately well off and they are disproportionately educated. Uh, this, this goes from the top, you know, from people like Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed who don't blow themselves up and maybe cynically manipulating people who really believe these things. But it goes all the way down through the 19 hijackers, all of whom were college educated. Many of them had PhDs. It goes to the leaders of Hamas and Hezbollah. And it goes down to the foot soldiers who blow themselves up. They are, th th your likelihood of dying if you were affiliated with Hezbollah, dying through suicide bombing, uh, goes up if you're better educated. 
I mean, this is, and, and support for suicide bombing goes up in conjunction with literacy. This is not a movement of the, of the poorest of the poor and the least educated. And that, and, and the idea that it, it, it would be nice if it were, I mean, that then the remedy is just spread the money around and teach people about, about all we've come to know in the last 2,000 years. Uh, but but the, our situation is quite a bit more sinister than that. It is possible to be someone with the, with the technical expertise, uh, uh, who, someone who can build a nuclear bomb, uh, and to still think you're going to get 72 virgins in paradise. That's what we should be worried about, that the, these beliefs really are operative, and the idea that no one believes them while everyone professes them, I think is an act of faith uh, none of us should be willing to uh, adopt. You know, world, it, happily, we do not assess public opinion by having New York Times journalists go out and live in the Muslim world and make friends and get a vibe. I mean, this is, this is not... A, a single well-run opinion poll would be worth a thousand years of you wandering around the Middle East. Well, How many people did you ask whether they supported suicide bombing? You, know, it, it, you, you could have lived there a long time and asked that question a lot and mm -hmm. still not have done anything like the job that Pew did when they went into nine countries and got a random sample, insofar as that was possible, of Muslims and asked 38,000 people that question. Okay? The, the responses were appalling. And, and the responses were appalling in countries that were the most cosmopolitan and the least uh, benighted by, by pre-modern standards. Um, it's, I mean, it's interesting to consider what, what level of support we would find consoling. You know, 2%, 5%, 10%. Well, I mean, 10% is still 140 million people in this world. But there were countries where it was, it was 75% and 80%. And Turkey, the great Muslim success story, uh, was down around 20%. Uh, but yes, suicide bombing is, when you think about it, something that really should be impossible. Uh, and it, it's, it is the least rational thing uh, even worse than suicide bombing, celebrating the suicidal atrocities of your children, which, Chris, I understand the mothers you have met didn't appear to be doing that, but there's no question that some mothers do do that, and this has been widely reported. Um, it, it is, it, if you really believe, just, it, it's, it's a perfectly rational thing to feel. If you really believe that martyrdom is true, if you really believe that, that your, your ch dead child, who was there a moment ago, is now in paradise waiting for you and you will really be reunited, uh, death is an illusion. And there are people who believe this, and, and there are people who, who express this belief violently uh, in conflicts that have nothing to do with us. I mean, the, 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 the war between Iran and Iraq was characterized on the Iranian side by this massive campaign of, of suicide bombing, where teenagers were just goaded out to clear minefields by their parents. Uh, uh, this is, this, we weren't involved. This is not, you know, the, the problem is not urban sprawl and NAFTA and the other degradations that, that, that Chris suggests uh, lead people to despair. Uh, there's no doubt that despair is a variable, but it matters what you believe in your despair. And again, I would take you back to despairing Janes. Uh, they're not going to practice suicide bombing because they believe something different. Well, let me, let me give you a, a sense of what it's like to be me having this conversation. <laughs> um, I mean, it seems to me we could have been having this conversation 500 years ago. And you know, life was difficult 500 years ago. There was a lot of despair. There were uh, you know, crops failed and, and disease spread. And uh, people suffered just... just instantaneous and catastrophic changes in their, their fortune. Uh, and it was well under, the cause of all of this actually was well understood 500 years ago. It was witchcraft. <laughs> and, and happily, the, the church had produced some very energetic men who, who had the gumption to deal with this problem. Uh, and so every year, some hundreds and, and sometimes thousands of women were burned alive for uh, casting spells on their neighbors. Now, uh, 
imagine what it would be like to be among the, the five or the ten percent of people at most who who recognize that the, the very belief in, in magic, the very belief in witchcraft, the, the very belief in good, good witches or bad witches was a, a malignant fantasy. Uh, that 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 the the you know the white witches who were who were helping people with medicinal herbs and practicing midwifery, uh, you know th they were no on no firmer ground than the black witches who were who were cast in the evil eye. Uh, the whole belief system was uh, at fault. Um, imagine the kind of criticism you're going to get. No, no, your problem is just with kind of fundamentalist witchcraft. Uh, the, 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 the reality is, is that witchcraft is far more nuanced than that, and there's no, there's no, there's, there's no conflict between science and witchcraft. I mean, you know, science deals with, with physical law and, 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 and physical causality, but witchcraft deals with, with potent spells and, and um, the internal connections between things. Um, uh, this idea that somehow we shouldn't call into question uh, these, these patently bad ideas for fear of offending people, for fear of uh, glossing over their despair, uh, uh, for fear of, of, of not criticizing other problems in the world. I would never argue that religion is the only problem in the world or the only uh, source of human conflict, but it is a source, uh, and we are mightily attached to it, uh, emotionally attached to it. Uh, and uh, we are loath to criticize it even when it is declaring its uh, uh, ugliest intentions and its, uh, and its, and its ugliest certainties. Uh, the problem with the Bible is, is whether, wh however you pick and choose, you, whether you're a literalist or a selective literalist, the problem is there's a, just a, a mountain of divisive nonsense in there, and that's where people get ideas about homosexuality be, being an abomination, and why our country in the 21st century debates gay marriage as though it were the great moral issue of our time. This is coming from religion, and uh, it seems to me that it's time we had an, on, an honest conversation about that. Oh, yeah. That's what oh, anybody I'm, who would I'm kill themselves or think they're going to get 72 virgins, um, you know, I got to say is insane. It's actually no crazier, though, than believing that a, a cracker literally turns into the body of Jesus. It has, it has terrible behavioral outcomes, but it is equally unsupported by evidence. And no. there's, a, there's this idea that, that beliefs, religious beliefs, can be kept separate, and they don't, they don't need to intrude into public policy, into politics, into science. And it's just not true. And so far as somebody actually believes something, it inevitably shows up in, in the world. I mean, the beliefs are the means to organize behavior and emotion. And so uh, presidents who really believe that uh, the book of Revelation is a guide to the end times could very well lead us into wars that, that, that conform to those, those bogus blueprints. Uh, and we have a, we have a, a Muslim a world that, that, that is lit up with notions of martyrdom and jihad and these are beliefs about explicit beliefs about how you get into paradise and 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 what it's worth living for and dying for. But yeah, I'm I'm arguing for a certain kind of intolerance. There's, there's no way around that. But it's not the kind of intolerance that gave us the gulag or that would put people in prison for their religious beliefs. I'm arguing for just new rules of conversation. We can call it conversational intolerance. Where, you know, if I came on your show and said the Holocaust never happened, I would immediately feel pressure from you. To, to justify that claim, or you would marginalize me immediately as someone who just could not be trusted, uh, at least on European history. But if I come on your show and say that I'm in dialogue with the creator of the universe, or if I know a cracker literally becomes the body of Jesus, if you say the right Latin words over it, you have to give me a pass. It's taboo to criticize that, and that's really what I'm challenging in my book. Well, it's true that Christians are playing their game very differently now in the 21st century, for the most part. That doesn't mean that, that there are not problems with Christianity. but the, th the thing to credit for that development is not Christianity itself or the Bible. It's to, it, we have to credit hundreds of years of secular dialogue and scientific insights that have forced us to ignore certain aspects of our scripture. Because the Inquisition... I, Sam, I don't think that's why Mother Teresa went to the streets of Calcutta. Well, but not because you have of to explain the Inquisition. Discourse. If you think that the, that the people who were killing heretics for 500 years in Europe had not read the Sermon on the Mount, you're sorely mistaken. But I asked both of them, 
you know, what would have happened if we had burned a Quran on tonight's show? And they knew what would happen. There would be riots in scores of countries. Embassies would likely burn. People would certainly get killed. And we would spend the rest of our lives hiding from theocrats uh, under a credible threat of death. Now, that's just a fact. It's a fact that neither of them would deny. Uh, and yet, what we have in response to ISIS, uh, ISIS who is crucifying people by the side of the road, uh, raping women by the thousands, torturing women, and, and burying children alive, in the name of Islam, we have a hashtag and we have some demonstrations. Now, I, I support the hashtag, I support some those demonstrations, but we need a groundswell of repudiation of this kind of behavior. And the problem is, and I'm not denying that some people repudiate it, and many millions of Muslims are horrified, but the problem is, ISIS is behaving in a way that is sanctioned by a literal reading of the Quran and the Hadith. You can, you can take sex slaves among the infidels. You should cut the infidels' heads off. This is a plausible version of, of the faith. And it's not a plaus plausible version of, of Buddhism. You know, so the comparison to the, the, the Buddhists who are in Myanmar now killing Muslims is, is a facile one because uh, the, these Buddhists are killing Muslims. It's horrible. It is a it is a sign of tribal violence, but it is not a sign of the of the implement an honest implementation of the doctrine of Buddhism. You can't find anywhere in the Pali Canon that tells you to go uh, uh, re destroy the lives of innocent people. Uh, that is something that that ISIS is doing, and they are doing it uh, very much in a paint by numbers way. Uh, and the, 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 the challenge is for Muslims to speak honestly about this and to reform the faith, find a way of contextualizing these beliefs and, and reinterpreting them. And there are Muslims who are doing that. Irshad Manji is doing that. Uh, Majid Nawaz is doing that. I, I totally support these people. Uh, but the Muslims who get on television, people like Reza Aslan and, and the liberal apologists like Glenn Greenwald and, and Nicholas Kristof, who say that this has nothing to do with Islam, ISIS or al-Qaeda, they're, they're just playing hide the ball with the articles of faith, and I think that is dishonest and, and ultimately dangerous for all of us. Well, well, and the irony is that even when someone like Nick Kristof thinks he's not agreeing with me, he's actually proving my point. So he's, he's arguing that, that we're not acknowledging all the people who are making heroic efforts to reform the faith or to criticize so-called extremism, but then he goes on to say how how much courage this takes because their lives are in danger in, in, in dozens of Muslim, Muslim countries merely for advocating for human rights, which of course proves my point. That the point is that there's a, what we're calling radical Islam or extremist Islam or fundamentalist Islam is massively well subscribed in the Muslim world and there are, there are reams of, of polling data to, to attest to this. We, many liberals want to grade Islam on a curve. You know, that just, that we're not expecting the same kind of civility and, and uh, openness to, to free speech and other liberties that we hold dear and our right to hold dear from Muslims throughout the world. And so, you know, when, when cartoonists draw the wrong cartoon and embassies start burning, we criticize the cartoonists and we criticize the, the newspapers that printed the cartoons and we practice self-censorship. We have an, there was an academic book at Yale University Press on the cartoon controversy that wouldn't publish the cartoons. This is just madness and yet and it's a double standard that if you actually want to look for, for, for racism and bigotry, mm -hmm. this is the bigotry of low expectations. This is, mm -hmm. this is a, a, a kind of racism that, and this, this point doesn't originate with me, my friend Ayan Hirsi Ali has made this point uh, okay. many times. Uh, and uh, so what we need is the same standard of, of reasonableness and tolerance applied across the board. Okay. Uh, but I'm very much a fan of construing this conflict between religion and science in zero-sum terms because science is intrinsically the enemy of dogmatism. Uh, and there is nowhere in our discourse where dogmatism is more celebrated than in the discourse of religion. So we do not respect stupidity in this country, but we systematically respect religious stupidity. And I think there's a basic truth about us that no double standard can, can erase. Either a person is being intellectually honest or he isn't. Either a person is willing to look dispassionately at the data or he's trying to, to conform the data to his prior conception of the world. 
And science, when it is working, which is to say when it is really science, amounts to a systematic eschewal of dogma. I mean, do dogma in science is humiliating whenever it's recognized to be dogma. Now to you is that it seemed to me you were, you're pointing out the role of bias in science. You're saying that you can, you know, you can pick out individual scientists or individual theories or individual moments in science where scientists were just flat wrong and they were wrong based on their own biases. And that is a totally legitimate thing to do. It is a totally scientific thing to do. I mean, you are, bias in science is bad science. Uh, bias in religion is faith, it's doctrine, it's redeeming, it's holy. I mean, we, it, you don't have the same corrective mechanism in religion. So uh, one truth, I think, in need of telling is this, that there really is a conflict between religion and science, between faith and reason. Because every religion is making claims about the way the world is. These are claims about the divine origin of certain books, about the virgin birth of certain people, about the survival of the human personality after death. These, are, these claims purport to be about reality. They are claims about what was and what is and what will be. And this inevitably puts religion on a collision course with science because these are claims made on bad evidence. And we don't have to distinguish hard science and soft science here. I mean, the, the, the core of science is not mathematical modeling. It is intellectual honesty. It is, a, it is a willingness to have our certainties about the world constrained by good evidence and good argument. Say that what, what troubles me, and I know troubles uh, Richard about this, is that religious people tend not to be honest about where those changes are coming from. They're coming from to my mind, the, the hammer blows of modernity that make certain religious doctrines untenable. So, for instance, now the, the, the Pope is rethinking the doctrine about contraception. You know, yeah. maybe, maybe a, a married couple, within the context of a marriage, if one is HIV positive, maybe it's okay to use a condom. Let's say he gives ground on that. Yeah. That will not be a sign of the vibrancy of Christian dialogue getting to the truth of the matter. That will be a sign of a given religious dogma becoming untenable in the face of its, of its practical consequences and in the face of the fact that there's no uh, good reason to have it there in the first place. Um, and so the only reason why a person needs faith to accept these claims is because the evidence for them is remarkably thin. So I, I really think it is time we admitted that faith is really the permission that religious people give one another to, to believe things strongly when reasons fail. Now there are of course many people who argue that there is no conflict between religion and science. How do they do this? Well here, here's how the trick is done. Uh, first they argue that, that science cannot prove that God does not exist. You know, atheism is a faith. If atheism, atheism is the faith that there is no God. Uh, can you prove that Jesus was not the Son of God? Can you prove that he did not rise from the dead on the third day? No. Now, I find it amazing how much, how much work these maneuvers actually do for people. It seems to me that Bertrand Russell, uh, I think as many of you know, closed the door to this kind of thinking for all time with his, his famous celestial teapot argument. I mean, can we prove that there's not a China teapot in elliptical orbit around the sun at this moment? No. Does it make it reasonable to believe in the existence of such a teapot? No. Is it reasonable to be agnostic about such a teapot? Not quite. <laughs> End of argument. I mean, the, the, it's obvious that the burden is not upon the atheist to prove the absence of celestial teapots. In the, in the face of any scientific finding, there are two different questions you can ask. You can ask, does this datum suggests the existence of God. Or you can ask, is this compatible with the existence of God? And these are, they seem similar. They're, they have very different results. Let me take one fact that 99% of all the species that have ever lived on Earth are now extinct. Does this fact suggest 
that an omniscient and omnipotent and perfectly benevolent God has designed our world. Not at all. I mean, that's probably the last thing you would infer from such a fact. But ask the other question. Ask, is, it, is this, this fact compatible with the existence of the biblical God? The answer to that question, of course, is yes. And it is always yes. You simply must add caveats like, who can understand the will of God? He may have wanted to destroy his creation uh, for some, some reason that surpasses our understanding. And of course, you can do this with hu human events. You, you look at the Holocaust. Would a reasonable person looking at the Holocaust, at the fact that millions of people were herded into ghettos and terrorized and then murdered and reduced to ash by their neighbors, would you, would you look at that series of events and say, well, there's probably an omniscient and perfectly benevolent and all-powerful God taking an interest in human affairs? You wouldn't. But, but is it compatible with the biblical God? Of course. You simply must say, God was very pissed off at the Jews, or we have something called free will, and God could not deny the Nazis such a golden opportunity to sin. Who can understand the will of God? As scientists, I think we have to observe that there is a profound difference between acquiring a picture of the world through a dispassionate analysis of the facts and acquiring it through patent emotionality and wishful thinking, and then only then looking to see if it can survive contact with the facts. Given the gaps in science and given the elasticity of religious thinking, it will always be possible to reconcile the most gratuitous nonsense with our modern scientific worldview. This is not the same thing as having scientific reasons to believe in God. There's a, there's a difference between, in a context like this, calling a spade a spade and really calling delusion delusion and doing it across the board in every social situation where you become this boorish character who, you know, you get into an elevator and you see someone with a cross around her neck and you <laughs> lurch to toward her and try to take away Jesus in that moment. Um, this is not something that anyone, I think, is advocating. I'm, I'm, not, I'm probably one of the more strident people here, um, and I'm not advocating that. But I think that even here we are suffering the, the, the taboos that, that I'm trying to call attention to, and I know Richard uh, quite eloquently and for many years has been calling attention to, um, the taboo around criticizing these esteemed religious myths uh, we can laugh at a belief in Zeus, but we can't laugh at a belief in Allah or the biblical God, even here. And I just, I just want to um, point out that I mean, our, our situation is so uncanny. I mean, we, we have a world that has been shattered by literature, and I think we have to marshal an, an emotional response that would the same response we would have if we woke up in a world tomorrow where. You know, the, the, all the violence in the Middle East, all the bloodletting, all the wars and, and, and threat of future war was born of rival interpretations of the plays of Shakespeare, where, you know, the, the Jews like King Lear and the Muslims like Hamlet, and they're willing to blow themselves up in crowds of children <laughs> over the difference. Okay, that, that seems like an impossibly bizarre world to live in, and yet that is exactly the world we are living in. And I, I, if, we could, if we could come face to face with that strangeness, uh, I think we wouldn't be wasting much time wondering about whether there is a conflict between religion and science. The first is I'm, I'm not discounting the role of kinship and other variables uh, in you know, the social cohesion and, and social pressures that get people to do uh, uh, terrifically unwise things. Um, and the problem for me is not uh, I'm not worried about the bad people in the world. I'm not worried about the, the sociopaths who have frontal lobe anomalies and can't feel empathy for others and therefore, you know, kill and eat people. Um, there are people like Jeffrey Dahmer in the world, and, you know, belief is not necessarily what is so operative. What, what, what scares me the most about certain kinds of divisive dogmatisms, and I think religion being the, the preeminent flavor of that, uh, and at this moment in its history, Islam being the, the uh, most uh, exquisitely uh, 
pungent of those flavors uh, is that it, it, it takes, it enables perfectly sane, perfectly rational people, uh, people who are not suffering obvious psychopathology, people who are not suffering uh, the kinds of oppressions that would lead any, you know, uh, anyone else to, to misbehave terribly, uh, to fly planes into buildings um, and to, to seek to get nuclear weapons so that they can blow themselves up in, in certain circumstances. I really think religion is leading us to the edge of something terrible. Uh, and I think if you look at, if you read the news, if you, if you watch the news, you, you see that much of the world is over the edge already. 53% of the U.S. population believes that the universe is 6,000 years old and that we have no genetic precursors in the natural world apart from Adam and Eve. Uh, there was a, a study done in 34 countries uh, assessing the, the level of belief in evolution, and, and the U.S. came in 33rd just before Turkey. This is embarrassing. Uh, but when you add to this, this comedy of false certainties the, the fact that 44% of Americans claim to be confident that Jesus is going to return to earth in their lifetime, uh, you see a, a terrible liability of this kind of thinking because when you, when you look at the, the prophecies uh, that, that describe these end of times events, uh, you see that it's not an exaggeration to say that something like half of the American population is eagerly anticipating the end of the world. Uh, I think it should be rather obvious that this kind of thinking provides people with no basis to, to make the hard decisions we have to make to create a durable civilization for ourselves, to make, to make geopolitical and environmental and economic policy that has a time horizon of not 50 years, but thousands of years. I mean, the desperation you hear from me and the frustration is that we are wasting time. I mean, this, this conference is purposed toward convincing someone like you that we even have a problem with religion. Uh, and that, I find that just an, a, a phantasmagorically strange situation to be in. Um, and that's, you know, you know, I'm sorry to be so strident, but, but it, uh, I think this really matters. You know, I mean, w which one of us wins this argument? I think really, I think the consequences of that really matters. God, I mean, I, I am the recipient of thousands upon thousands of emails now uh, from people who used to be fundamentalists. Who, who got argued out of it. I mean, the, 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 the trying to square their ludicrous beliefs about the world with the consequences of those beliefs and with the, with the testimony of rationality on a hundred fronts has eroded their confidence in those beliefs. And, you know, you wouldn't know this. I mean, we have this kind of shibboleth which says you can't, what, 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 was, what, what wasn't reasoned into existence can't be reasoned out. The, the truth, I think, is rather much closer to, the, to this, that people are making desperate efforts, rather heroic efforts, every day of their lives to be reasonable, to, to have a coherent worldview. And when those efforts become too costly or too embarrassing, they, you know, dogma loses. And, and I, I can just tell you that there are, there are ministers in, in this country preaching to flocks, ministers who have completely lost their belief but can't figure out what other job to do. And so we're just literally getting up on Sundays, uh, espousing what they now know to be nonsense. Um, and uh, there's every permutation of that. There are fundamentalists who become moderates, moderates who become atheists. Uh, and so it's, it's just not true that people can't be argued out of their beliefs. I think this, this idea that there's love on the one hand and then the cool rationality of science that's just all clatter and clockwork and soulless this, this is a false dichotomy, and it's a, it's a dichotomy that is pervasive mm -hmm. in the culture. I, you know, you can't sign, you know, I can't tell you how many times I get on the, on the radio and someone says, scientifically prove to me that you love your wife, mm -hmm. as though that were just the knockdown argument of all time against, you know, against reason and in support of faith. Um, there's nothing irrational in principle about love. I mean, it, it is rational to value love. It is rational to try to, ma to, to recognize that it is, one of our uh, uh, most cherished experiences, and, and then to try to, to, to live a life that maximizes it. Understanding love at the level of the brain is not going to deflate its, its importance for us. I um, mean, the fact that we, we can understand the molecular constituents of chocolate doesn't make us not want to eat chocolate. I mean, these are different scales of, of interaction with the world. And um, so it's not a matter of only being coldly calculating in, in our approach to life. 
But uh, where we have to call a spade a spade is in gratuitous claims to certainty about invisible realities and the moral structures to the, to the universe, about a God who so hates homosexuality that he will whip up tsunamis uh, in defense of, of chaste heterosexual people. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a vision of life that is animating millions and millions of our neighbors, and we have been cowed into not criticizing it. And I mean, to pick up what Pat Churchland said, this job is not best done by scientists. This is the, we need from from a hundred sides, culture at large, to to just make it fundamentally embarrassing to hold these kinds of certainties. If the Quran was exactly the way it is, but it contained a a single extra line, and that line read, um, "If you see a a red-haired woman on your doorstep at uh, sunset, cut her head off." Okay, just imagine a text like this that comes down through the ages that, that contains a line like that. I can tell you what kind of world we would live in. We would live in a world where red-haired women would be found murdered in the Muslim world. We would, you know, we would open the New York Times and we would hear that there were you know, 20 heads found in a bag and they were all red-haired women. Um, and uh, we would also live in a world in which apologists for Islam would say, would, would look at that behavior and say, that has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, there was a, a new story uh, yesterday about a, uh, a Mormon man who killed his wife, and she had red hair. Uh, many of those women who were found in the, you know, whose heads were found in the bag in Baghdad were not actually uh, redheads, but the, some were strawberry blonde. Uh, uh, we would hear about uh, you know women who were shot and not decapitated, and decapitation is the only thing that is sanctioned in the Quran. I mean, this is the kind of gymnastics we would be faced with, um, and and the the basic fact about the Quran, as it is with so many other books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and and uh, there's nothing worse than Leviticus and Deuteronomy, as far as I can tell, uh, but people ignore them, as Richard pointed out. The basic problem with the Quran is that it really does preach hatred and fear of the infidel far more eloquently than it preaches anything else. And the greatest problem with the rest of us, with, with secularists and religious moderates and scientists, is that we find it very difficult to believe that people actually believe this stuff. So, secularists and, and religious moderates almost by definition don't know what it's like to be certain of God, to be certain of paradise to be certain that the book they keep by their bed is the perfect word of the creator of the universe. And therefore they tend to discount the utterances of, of people who really are certain as propaganda, as, as, as behavior that's, that's really a cover for, for behavior that's being motivated by economics and politics. I, mean, I don't know how many more engineers and architects need to fly planes into our buildings before we realize that this is not merely a matter of lack of education or, econ or economic despair. Pointed out, there's no question that our, our morality precedes our humanity even. I mean, we, we have experiments where mice are shown to be more disturbed at the suffering of familiar mice than unfamiliar mice. We know that, that monkeys will uh, withstand painful shocks to, to uh, or will, will uh, withstand starvation to keep their, their cage mates from receiving painful shocks. We know that chimpanzees show obvious concern over, over uh, uh, fairness in the allocation of food rewards. I mean, these are the kinds of findings you would expect if uh, our morality were somehow an emergent property of, of biology. So you have a dogma like, like uh, contraception use is immoral, this, this classically Catholic idea. This seems potentially benign. I mean, it seems like you know, at the, in the worst case you're going to get overpopulation, but then you map that onto sub-Saharan Africa where you have Catholic ministers preaching the sinfulness of condom use in regions of the world where AIDS is epidemic to people who have no other information about condom use but the representation of the ministry. And so what I've argued elsewhere, this is, this is genocidally stupid, this behavior. Uh, and yet because, as Stephen points out, because it is coming under the aegis of a person's religious conviction, it is immune to the kind of criticism that we would, we would normally marshal against it. The best in us does not require the worst in us. We, our, our love of other human beings does not need to be nurtured by delusion.
And yet we are hearing continuously from every corner of our culture that delusion is all we have. Delusion deserves our respect. Delusion is holy. Point out is that it should be rather obvious to everyone that we can find reasons to treat other human beings well, uh, to help them in times of suffering, that don't require uh, that we believe anything preposterous about the nature of the universe. We don't have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin to help people. Uh, and I think, it's, uh, I think perhaps Richard pointed this out, it is rather more noble to help people purely out of concern for their suffering than it is to help them because you think the creator of the universe wants you to do it or will reward you for doing it or will punish you for not doing it. Uh, so the problem, one problem with this linkage between religion and morality is that it actually gives people bad reasons to help other human beings. When good reasons are available, it's interesting to notice that even if we got our morality out of religion, even if religion was supremely useful, this would not be an argument for the existence of God. I mean, just, just imagine, imagine if atheists were really reliably immoral and religious people were, the, were exquisitely moral. Would this argue for the specific truth of Christian doctrine or the doctrine of Islam? But faith can, could function like a placebo. The idea of God could be perfectly vacuous and yet incredibly useful. I think there's much evidence to suggest that it's not, but even if it were, this is not a, an argument for the truth of religious doctrine. And this is, this is surprisingly hard for people to see, uh, and it is amazingly easy to see when you change the subject from God to uh, some ordinary proposition. I mean, just imagine if I claim that I'm, a, uh, I'm one of the fastest people who has ever lived, and I could have won many Olympic gold medals uh, in track and field had I only tried. Uh, now, if you ask me why I believe this about myself, uh, uh, well, let's, let's say I maintain this even in, contrary to the evidence, even in the company of, of Olympic sprinters who can run circles around me. Uh, you ask me why I believe this. What if I said things like, well, uh, being the fastest man alive has brought me immense satisfaction? Or what if I said, uh, you know, that the, winning a gold medal in the Olympics is one of the highest human honors and just imagining those medals around my neck uh, just, just makes me feel uh, fantastic and gives my life meaning. It, it's pretty clear what is wrong with these answers. I mean, this is the, the, the fact that it would be nice if something were true, or the fact that believing it to be true gives you positive, some positive effect in your life is not a reason to believe that it is true. And we readily understand this in every area of our lives. And this is why we have phrases like wishful thinking and self-deception and delusion. What do our neighbors believe? Well, 22% of Americans claim to be certain, literally certain, that Jesus is going to come down out of the clouds sometime in the next 50 years. Another 22% think he probably will sometime in the next 50 years. That's, that's 44% of the electorate. Now, of course, this belief does not exist in isolation. This, it's not an accident that 44% of Americans also believe that the creator of the universe literally promised the land of Israel to the Jews. This is in his capacity as an omniscient real estate broker. And these beliefs are knit together with, with a myriad of other beliefs, infatuations with, with the end of history, with apocalyptic prophecy. And th these beliefs have, have geopolitical consequences. This is not just what people believe on Sundays. 44%, actually in, a, in the last Gallup poll it was up to 53%, something like half of us are creationists. You know, intelligent design is not what they're fancying. They believe that we were created from mud with divine breath sometime in the last 6,000 years. You know, Adam and Eve standing in a garden with a talking snake and a hankering for apples. But this is literally the vision of the creation of our species. So um, what I'm advocating, really, and what I advocate in my book is a kind of conversational intolerance. I, I, this, we don't need new laws. We don't have laws against 
Holocaust deniers. You know, that you, all we need is a, a standard of intellectual honesty where people who pretend to be certain about things they're clearly not certain about receive some conversational pressure. The circumstance we are in is much more sinister than many want to realize. It is possible to be so well educated that you can build a nuclear bomb and to still think you're going to get the 72 virgins in paradise. That, that is how partitioned the human mind is and that is how, how balkanized our discourse is. That is how immune religious propositions are to, to critical pressure, conversational pressure in our discourse. And it would be impossible as a Jain. I mean, the Jains, the, this religion of India that has some 10 million subscribers, I think, the core of their religion is nonviolence. In, no matter how deranged you get by the, your doctrine as a Jain, you will get less and less violent. I mean, the, the, the really religious Jains cover their mouths with cheesecloth so they don't inhale a, a bug. By no stretch of the imagination can you argue that the core principle of Islam is nonviolence. Another problem with religious moderation is that it is theologically bankrupt. It, 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 it is not like if we just read the books more closely, we would discover all these reasons to be moderates. But I got news for you, I've read the books. God is not a moderate. What you find in these books, you, you, there's no place in the books where God says, you know, when you get to the new world and you develop your three branches of government and you have a civil society, you can just jettison all the barbarism I recommended in the first books. <laughs> Another problem with religious moderation is that it is intellectually bankrupt. It, it really represents a, a, a fundamentally unprincipled use of reason. At least fundamentalists talk about evidence. Fundamental, you ask a fundamentalist, why do you believe that Jesus was the Son of God and the Bible is the perfect Word of God? You'll get reasons. They're not good reasons, but you'll, you, will get, you will immediately see that these people are engaged in an evidentiary pursuit. They'll say things like, the New Testament confirms all of Old Testament prophecy, or every prophecy in the Bible has, has come true. You know, these are specious claims, but contrast that to what moderates say. Moderates don't talk about evidence. Moderates talk about meaning. They, they talk about the good effects of believing as they do. Now, just take that kind of talk into, a, into another area. I mean, just, just change God to some other consoling proposition and appreciate what a non sequitur that is as to, to, to the question, why do you believe in God? This is actually an example from my book. Imagine your neighbor believes that he's got a diamond buried in his backyard that's the size of a refrigerator. Can you ask him why? And he says things like, well, you don't understand. This diamond gives my life a lot of meaning. Or my family loves the, the gatherings we have on the lawn digging this pit every Sunday. And you know, are we going to take that away from us? Or imagine if he said, I wouldn't want to live in a universe if, where there wasn't a diamond buried in my backyard that's the size of a refrigerator. It, it's pretty clear, it's immediately clear, that th those responses would be inadequate. Deeply inadequate. Those really are the responses of a madman or an idiot. And yet, take the same kind of thinking into the religious domain, and th th these responses have immense prestige. In fact, unless you endorsed some th thinking of that kind, you could not possibly get elected to political office in this country. It, but it, it's important to point out that nobody ever says these passages are immoral. I mean, the idea that you, have to, you, you find a, that a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night and you stone her to death. You stone homosexuals to death. If your kids talk back to you, you stone them to death. If you go into a town and you see someone praying to a foreign god, you kill him, you kill his family, you kill everyone in the town. Okay, these are not metaphors. These are not analogies for some spiritual struggle within. These are, are explicit directives to kill people for theological crimes. No one ever says 
this is immoral. The be- Christians just say we don't have to do this anymore because Jesus brought us the doctrine of grace. Well, incidentally, Jesus also said that every jot and every tittle of the law has to be fulfilled. So the inquisitors of the Middle Ages had a, had a rationale for practicing this kind of law. And I can assure you that St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas had, had read the Sermon on the Mount. They managed to square the ministry of Jesus with their impulses to kill people for thought crimes. But it, it's important to point out that nobody ever says these passages are immoral. I mean, the idea that you have to, you, you find a, that a woman is not a virgin on her wedding night and you stone her to death. You stone homosexuals to death. If your kids talk back to you, you stone them to death. If you go into a town and you see someone praying to a foreign god, you kill him, you kill his family, you kill everyone in the town. Okay, these are not metaphors. These are not analogies for some spiritual struggle within. These are, are explicit directives to kill people for theological crimes. No one ever says this is immoral. The be- Christians just say we don't have to do this anymore because Jesus brought us the doctrine of grace. Well, incidentally, Jesus also said that every jot and every tittle of the law has to be fulfilled. So the inquisitors of the Middle Ages had a, had a rationale for practicing this kind of law. And I can assure you that St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas had, had read the Sermon on the Mount. They managed to square the ministry of Jesus with their impulses to kill people for thought crimes. If the Bible is the best book we have in the West, in ethical terms, we should be practicing slavery. The creator of the universe clearly expects us to keep slaves. He simply tells us not to beat our slaves so severely that we put out their eyes or their teeth. Jesus clearly expected us to keep slaves. He never criticizes the institution of slavery. He, he uses analogies with slaves. Paul, in 1 Timothy, admonishes slaves to serve their masters well and to serve their, their Christian masters especially well so that they can partake in their holiness. If this, the abolitionists were absolutely on the wrong side of the theological debate. If this is the wisest book we have, the slaveholders of the South were right. Or take another belief that really should be, this should just be a curiosity to us until you see its consequences in the world, that the Catholic idea that condom use is somehow immoral. And this is, this is a, a genuinely ludicrous idea. I, I can assure you that the the powers of the human brain are insufficient to provide a good argument for this. But map this onto sub-Saharan Africa, where literally millions, something like three and a half, four million people, die each year from the spread of AIDS. And what you have there are Catholic ministers literally preaching the sinfulness of condom use in villages where the only information about condom use is the representation of the ministry. It seems to me that the time for respecting beliefs of this sort is long past. This is genocidal stupidity. It is criminal negligence of a sort that we would not tolerate in any other institution, yet the Vatican cannot be criticized to the degree that it should because it's the Vatican. And there is an overarching taboo around criticizing religious faith. I mean, take this, this idea that, that religion and science are mutually compatible and, and, and ask different questions and broadcast it onto the current debate about stem cell research. I mean, from a biological point of view, stem cell research is one of the most promising areas of research in biology to generate medical therapies for scores of conditions. There are literally tens of millions of people in our own country, suffering from diabetes, from spinal cord injury, Parkinson's, full body burns. And stem cell research is, is, well, who knows when and how it'll pan out, any biologist will tell you this is what we should be doing, and yet we're not funding it at the federal level. The concern from the religious point of view is that we have to destroy three-day-old human embryos to conduct this research. And the, converse, the, the ethical debate stops there. 
it is just merely asserted from the religious point of view that three-day-old human embryos have souls. You have souls in the Petri dish, you have souls in the little girl with diabetes, you can't, you know, the interests of, uh, who can weigh the interests of one soul against another? We never have to get into the details because faith stops the conversation. You just have to respect the faith proposition that life starts at the moment of conception, whatever that means. Well, let's talk about the details for a second. Perhaps it sounds scary to destroy human embryos. A, a three-day-old human embryo is a collection of 150 cells. They're arranged in a sphere. There is no brain. There's no nervous system. Maybe 150 cells sounds like a lot of cells. There are 100,000 cells in the brain of a fly. Flies have brains, they have neurons, they have neurons very much like our own. If we know anything at all about the relationship between physical complexity and the, and the, and the possibility of having experience, and the possibility of having interests, we know that more suffering is visited upon this earth every time we swat a fly than when we kill a three-day-old human embryo. It's not enough to say they're potential human beings. You know, given given the, the advances in genetic engineering, every cell in the human body with a nucleus is a potential human being given the right manipulation. Every time the, the president scratches his nose, he's engaged in a holocaust of potential human beings. <laughs> Take the idea that, that there are souls in these embryos. Well, embryos at this stage can split into twins. So what happens? We have one soul that becomes two souls. E embryos at, a, at an even later stage can fuse into what's called a chimera, becoming a single individual. So we have, we have two souls coming into one soul. The, the arithmetic of souls doesn't make sense. No one is ever burdened with the, with the responsibility of trying to make sense of it because Faith stands in for ethical argument. So I'm, I'm just asking you to imagine what it would be like to have a society where our conversation about human well-being could proceed totally unconstrained by dogma, where really we could bring the full measure of our creativity to bear on questions of human happiness. And my argument is that to get there, to get from here to there, the end game for civilization is not mere tolerance of other people's irrationality. It is not political correctness. It is reason. Thank you very much.